From the time I was a kid, I was never still. And I've never been one to wait for things to happen to me. I've heard it said that only amateurs wait for inspiration. Professionals get up every day and go to work. In other words, proper artists don't hope that inspiration will come to them. They actively seek it out. At first, I just wanted to travel. And photography was a way to allow me to do that. I was actually very f happy and um, uh, encouraging of her in, in the book. I thought it would be uh, because uh, she knows so many of the stories of, the, of our family. Uh, we've worked together. Um, we, we've worked together <clears throat> with my photography since uh, 30 years or more. And if, if there was going to be one definitive book, uh, it, she would be the best person to do it. So I, I was a willing participant. But uh, Mongolia was, you know, people often ask me, um, you know, where haven't you been in the world? Where would you like to go if you could, you know, write your own ticket? If, if you had a kind of your wish list of places to go to, uh, where would you like to go that you haven't been? And um, Mongolia was very close to the top of the list because it's, it's uh, very remote. Uh, culturally, it's very interesting. They... Um, one of the last places in the world where they have um, uh, reindeer herders and eagle hunters. So this was a place that I really wanted to visit. It was so rewarding photographically, so interesting, that um, I, I think it was uh, one of the great kind of photo uh, shoots of my career. And, um, and, and the, you know, the world's changing so rapidly that these kind of places are disappearing and and maybe in another generation uh, you know the the eagle hunters and the reindeer herders will be will be gone they'll be um, they'll have jobs I, I think it's important to uh, document these ways of life because um, somebody has to I felt like it's um, important to make a record a document some kind of a memory of these uh, cultures which are once they're gone, <coughs> We need to be able to look back at our past and celebrate that past and say, you know, at one time in our history, there were people that actually, uh, you know, lived with reindeer uh, and hunted with eagles. And it's just, it'll be something fantastic, which people won't understand or believe that if you have a, a some kind of a visual history of it, uh, they'll be able to be a proof that this actually existed at one time. Well, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of pictures of me working in the field, but um, there are times when I've thought it was important to pass my camera to somebody to have them, you know, photograph me working. I, I think of a story I worked on uh, on the monsoon, and you know, when you see a picture of people in the rain or up to their chest in water, y you often don't realized that there was some poor photographer that was actually in the water uh, or getting wet. I mean, they look at the picture, oh, these poor people are, you know, <laughs> but actually I was suffering uh, along, you know, with them. So I thought it was important to actually have some uh, visual, you know, some, some picture of that. Well, that foot you referred to was in... What, what is it? 
Oh, it's an art installation in Umbria in a museum. I can't remember the name of the, the village, but it's this skeleton, this full skeleton. And uh, I just kind of photographed that one foot. I thought it was um, funny, you know, kind of. Uh, Elliot Ur was, Ur, Ur was kind of funny. Um, but uh, no, I think that um, Italy is so full. I think, you know, we've, I've read that, you know, maybe 40% of the world's art is here in, in Italy. One of the great things about Italy, I think, which is that so much of the culture and the architecture and the villages and so much of the, the, the physical beauty is still intact. Well, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, suffering is part of life. That There's suffering all around us. So we all suffer in certain ways. Um, it, it's very easy to see the world uh, see the glass half empty. People, people often ask me, uh, you know, are you an optimist or how do you feel about the future of the, the world and the state of things at this point? And I, I often want to say, um, well, you know, we should ask that question to, uh, to the elephants and, and to the, the, the tigers and some of the whales and some of the animals that uh, inhabit the planet because um, I'm sure the elephants are not very happy at this point. I just saw something recently uh, on the BBC where uh, they were saying that maybe in nine years that uh, the rate of the, the elephants being killed by poachers is, is where in, in a few years there won't be any elephants left in the wild. And that just seems impossible. It seems crazy. So um, I think that uh, we need to um, know these things and, and to... I think that it, some of these sad stories need to be told. Uh, maybe it'll help to I improve the world or life or whatever. But I, I just, um, uh, you know, sometimes you identify with those emotions. I, I think if we're aware of some of the suffering in the world, that, that some people may want to express some sense of compassion. Uh, so we have to know the problem in order to, you know... Um, I, I'm thinking about this um, so-called caravan uh, coming up, these people who have been suffering and living uh, really in a very difficult way because of violence or whatever. And um, th they're suffering, many of them, and there seems to be at this point a, a lack of compassion. Uh, I mean, the United, United States has always been a, a country that welcomed refugees and people in need. And at this point in time, to turn our backs on those people with, with zero compassion. Not only that, but sending soldiers to the border in order to protect against these, this ragtag group of a few, several hundred or a thousand, whatever, is, a, is absurd. And uh, it, it's, it's shameful, the, the attitude towards this kind of a situation where this suffering, which you, you talked about, is being met not only with disregard, but actually hostility. Um, it, it's really unconscionable. I don't know, the world's kind of gone crazy. The, the influx of refugees I into Europe, I, I guess there's a tipping point where people start to get sort of fed up. Um, uh, but I think in the case of, uh, I heard somebody say recently that um, instead of sending 5,000 soldiers to the border, and, and putting barbed wire on the fence, they should have sent 5,000 lawyers to sort out the individual. Because if they're coming for uh, asylum, then, uh, you know, why not give them a hearing? I mean, are, are all the people in the caravan honest uh, refugees or asylum seekers? Of course not. But l let's at least try and get to the bottom and figure out who's a legitimate uh, you know, uh, asylum seeker, and who who isn't? I mean, how difficult can that be? There's not so many of them. So um, I don't know. I, I think that um, there's a lot of uh, racism in the world now, which is seems to be at least in the U.S. Uh, again, seems to be increasing. Uh, but but I think that um, again, compassion, understanding, an enlightened point of view about some of these people in need it would be a much better approach than just sort of knee-jerk reaction that, you know, the, the gates are closed, we don't care who you are, we don't care what your circumstances are, uh, we don't want to know. 
And I think that's really uh, sad and unfortunate. Una occasione. No, my, my, actually that question about uh, my favorite picture, which I've been asked over the years and I've never been quite able to answer it. But Do it now. Do it first. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my favorite picture right now is of uh, my, my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been, it's been amazing. I, I only wish that she could, that she would remember all these places she's been to. She, there's the, the, I've photographed her in, in, you know, the Acropolis and, and, and Easter Island, and I was in Athens and Easter Island. Uh, we've been to Burma we've, twice. We've been to Italy several times. Um, but no, she's, it's a joy to go out and work during the day and to come back in the evening um, and uh, spend time with, with uh, Andy and Lucia. Um, now she's getting a bit too wild and uh, to, to really travel with. Although we're, we're going to be going to, um, we're going to continue to travel, but she's been around the world three times already. Uh, so um, it's, been, it's been amazing. It's been great. And um, I, I want to do a book just about her and our travels together someday. Uh, I have a photographic record of all these trips, and uh, it's, it's really been remarkable. So That's, that's Lucia. <laughs> ecco sua figlia Lucia. <laughs> this is fantastic. She started reading very early. Ha iniziato a leggere da molto giovane, come vedete. Oh, that's, that's uh, Andy and Lucia. This is one of our trips. Lucia's World Tour 2018. This was just one of our trips. It started in New York, uh, through Europe, and then uh, uh, different Moscow and Paris, and back to Tucson. Ecco, questo è stato il primo giro del mondo di Lucia insieme a Andy. Abbiamo iniziato partiti da New York, siamo andati in Europa, Mosca e poi Parigi, eccetera. Oh, that's us in Bhutan. Questo, that's in the book, this picture. Questo eravamo in Bhutan insieme e, e parte del libro questa. So we dressed up in the local Bhutanese. E ci siamo naturalmente vestiti costume. con i costumi del Bhutan locali. That was a lot of work. Eh, insomma, <laughs> è stato un bel lavoro quello lì. Grazie, Natale. Grazie, Bonnie, bravissima. You're very welcome. Amen.